just to kick off, was there ever going to be another career direction for you other than music? Well, I started out as a, a bricklayer. I, I served my apprenticeship uh, when I left school, and I, 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 I continued that until I was uh, 21. And then uh, I've been doing music at the same time, though, of course. But uh, my heart was always in the, in the music side of things. I, 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 as much as I enjoyed bricklaying, mind you, I, I really did enjoy it. But uh, I, was, I had my mind in the clouds, and I wanted to be a musician. Tell us about growing up in Christchurch. Was it swept up in the in the birth of rock and roll as much as the rest of the world? Oh yeah. Uh, well, you know, see, I uh, I sort of got into rock and roll sort of uh, through my parents, as a matter of fact. Uh, I, I, I learned to play guitar when I was about 11, uh, ten or eleven, and then I, I I gave it up because it was boring. You know, the the, the things that the uh, music teachers gave you to to uh, practice on were things like beautiful brown eyes and uh, you know. You know uh, you know, all, all sort of old, old, uh, old-fashioned type songs that, that I, you know, kid of ten or eleven doesn't have much interest in, and um, and then uh, when uh, rock and roll hit, uh, I, I, I had a record. I heard the, the record of uh, Little Richard and uh, Long Tall Sally, and that just turned my whole head around. I mean, I, I got back into the, uh, the playing the guitar again, and uh, you know, I didn't go back and have lessons. I just started picking it up and, and playing the rock and roll things and in the meantime my parents uh, and uh, had got involved with, with some folks um, to try and keep the kids off the street in Christchurch because at that time you know when Rock Around the Clock came out and Blackboard Jungle uh, there was nowhere to go in Christchurch at all on the weekend so the kids would hang around in the, uh, in the square and get into fights and uh, you know be causing trouble and all that stuff so we, we decided to open up a, a teenage club and of course uh, I had a you know, couple of guys that I was playing with at that time and, and we were the band that played at the teenage club Was it a competitive music scene in those early days over there? Uh, no, we were the only game in town. <laughs> uh, uh, well, there was a, a guy called Martin Winiata who, who was a, a, a sort of a carryover from the uh, the Second World War. He went in insane troops and all that sort of stuff during the Second World War. And he was a wonderful man, and I, I, I loved him dearly. Uh, he played saxophone and sang, and he, he was the first one that sort of played any rock and roll in the town of Christchurch. But... Um, uh, he was well in his 50s at that stage and uh, I sort of came along and I was 16 or no, I was, I was even earlier than that, uh, younger than that. I was probably about 14 or 15 and uh, I, I sort of took over from where he left off and uh, we were virtually for a long time the only rock and roll band in Christchurch. Then of course came along Ray Columbus and the Invaders and, and, and bands like that. Was it um, pretty much a case of having achieved all you could in New Zealand that, that prompted the, the move to Australia? Well, we, yeah, it, it was, because we, we'd sort of toured around, uh, you know, uh, we're jumping a bit here, but uh, uh, we'd moved up to Auckland uh, after I'd finished bricklaying, f finished my apprenticeship, and, uh, you know, uh, decided I was going to be a professional music musician, which, of course, was totally outlandish in those days for anybody to even think of making a, a living out of music but um, um, we moved up to Auckland and then, and then became uh, involved with people like Harold Morrison Quartet Bill and Boyd uh, of course uh, we did the records with Dinah Lee all those hits she had and we used to tour through New Zealand uh, for about a year and a half or something like that and then in the, in what happened was that uh, <clears throat> I got an offer to do a tour in Australia with uh, uh, a guy called Sheb Woolley who uh, had a, a record out at the time called Purple People Eater. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and so we, we went over to Australia and toured with him on the, on uh, all the stadiums around Australia at the time, you know, the main centres with uh, the likes of the Deltones and Lucky Star and people like that. And uh, then we came back to uh, Auckland after that. And in the meantime, what had happened was Billy Thorpe had come out. Uh, he, he wasn't even in, in existence when we were over there. Billy came out in the meantime and uh, usurped us. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, Ray Columbus and the Invaders came over and had uh, She's a Mod. And, and, and uh, so it was, it was a hard battle for us to get back in after we'd already been over there and got our foot in, you know. 
Did you have any preconceived notions of what to expect when, when you settled here? Uh, well, you know, I, I, I've used this uh, phrase before. When I, when I first landed in, uh, in Sydney uh, at that time when we did the Share Bully Show, I, I, I looked up at, at the, you know, I'm a country boy virtually, you know, and we, we landed in Sydney and I looked up there and I, said, I felt like a, a grain of sand in a bucket, <laughs> you know, because it, it was so big and I, and I thought to myself, how in the hell can you make yourself known to, you know, so many people that are spread out over su such a wide area, you know, how do you go about doing that? And uh, it turned out the only thing where you can do it is just plug away and keep on going and playing around the gigs and doing all that. But it, when we first arrived in in, uh, in Sydney a, as, uh, you know, like a full-fledged thing when we moved over to Australia, you know, we couldn't get arrested. It took, it took forever for us to get our foot in the door. It took uh, a while for you to have a, a settled bad line up here too, too didn't it? Was that, was that a frustrating time for you? It was, you know, because, uh, you know, t two of my guys left, Teddy Toy and, and Johnny Dick left my band and joined Billy Thorpe. And uh, so I got uh, guys to replace them who, who were fabulous, John Blake on bass and, and Bill Fleming on drums. Uh, but uh, it, it, I didn't feel happy at the time. Uh, it, it just wasn't going in the right direction. So I brought over Billy Christian and uh, Jimmy Hill, who was with the Invaders. Uh, Billy had been with me earlier in New Zealand. Uh, and uh, we we went down to Melbourne, and uh, that's when things started to move a little bit. When we went down to Melbourne, there was there were so many clubs in Melbourne in those days, and uh, it was a joy to work down there. Reading through the uh, the biography on your website, it says that um, you're pretty keen to shake off that cabaret band type image, that suit and tie type image. Were, were you terribly image conf conscious in in those days? Oh, well, you know, it wasn't so much me. It was uh, you know, the management we, we had at the time. You know, they uh, they insisted on us doing all that stuff, and they insisted on us um, playing uh, like places like the Mandarin Club, and we we played at a place called the Y and I, which was great. Uh, it got a little bit little bit more casual there, but but uh, you know, they were sort of put it, putting us in the places where there was poker machines and all that sort of stuff, and you know, you. You're battling to, to get above the noise of the poker machines, yeah. uh, and and it, it just wasn't my environment, and I wasn't very happy in that atmosphere. And I, by this time, I'd sort of fa found my voice. Uh, uh, you know, I struggled for many years, like looking to find where my niche was. And uh, I got into the uh, vaults of EMI in the old days, and and found all these wonderful records by people like the uh, Impressions and and uh, uh, the Temptations, Four Tops, and. Uh, you know, all, all the black artists of America and uh, I can Tina Turner, of course, and people like that. But, uh, and, and that's where I found, uh, you know, my, 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 I, I certainly don't have a, you know, a, a very finessed voice. Uh, it sounds like a gargle and sheep dip, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's the kind of work for me on, on a, on a very, uh, you know, minor basis. But, yeah. uh, Talk about some of your past band members. One past uh, meteor was uh, Bruno Lawrence, of course, who, who found fame later as an actor. What, what can you tell us about Bruno as a musician? What what, what did he bring to the band? Oh, he, he was fabulous to play with. He, it was like sitting on a keg of dynamite every night because you never knew what was going to happen. He was very, you know, uh, spontaneous. Uh, but unfortunately, old Bruno had a very short attention span. You know, and he only stayed with the band for uh, 12 months, and uh, then he moved on and went back and he actually jumped ship on us. We were doing a cruise around the islands, and uh, he jumped ship and, and uh, left us in, in Auckland. So I played the drums on, all the way back on the ship. <laughs> The Bruno's replacement, of course, was Stewie Spears, who uh, was already something of a music veteran uh, before he joined you. Uh, well, playing... he, he was for, he was forty when he joined the band. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he predates. But, uh, he predated. Stewie, 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 yeah, Stewie was fabulous. I mean, we became very dear friends. I didn't know him all that much until until he actually joined the band, but he ended up being my dearest friend and. Uh, uh, a wonderful drummer. I've always said it was like sitting in a big armchair when when you were playing with Stewie because he made he, he sort of encompassed you. You know, he surrounded you because it, his sound was so big and and it didn't matter if the rest of the band fell over. You know, as long as Stewie and me were happening, it was fine. A major incident in in both your life and career was, of course, that horrific road accident in, in 1967. Not too far from where I'm talking to you now. What what do you recall of that day? 
Well, we're on our way uh, to Morwell uh, to do a gig, and uh, we never arrived. Uh, we just uh, we had a head-on with a with a big Dodge Phoenix, a big old heavy American car, and uh, that sort of put a stop to that uh, episode. Uh, and uh, we we were off the road for about six months, I think it was. And we we decided. Um, I was out earlier. I was only in the hospital about a couple of couple of weeks, three weeks or something. And um, Bob Bertels, uh, myself, and and Stewie were the ones that were hurt. But um, we decided that we wouldn't, uh, you know, fold the band up. We we'd, we'd stick together and wait till everybody got back on their feet. And so consequently, we we had uh, Graham Morgan who used to come come in and uh, play a few things. Uh, Stewie would. Uh, start off and f- play um, one set, and then he'd get very tired because he was, you know, he was hurting. It was an incredible amount of pain, and uh, uh, so Graham Morgan would come in and play drums for a few uh, a set, and then Stewie would play another set, and so we sort of weaned him back into the system, you know, over a period of uh, two or three months. But we were determined not to break up, and it brought the band really close together. You know, we felt we felt like we'd been to hell and back, and and, and it was it made us you know sort of really tight. Yeah, that was my next question. Do you felt do you feel looking back now that really unified the band, having to go through all that together? I most certainly did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we 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 all felt like it was us against the world. You know. One of my all-time favourite albums is that, that wonderful uh, self-titled album of 1970. It stands up and still sounds fantastic today, has a, a timeless quality about it. Do you recall much about the making of that record? Uh, you mean the brown cover? The brown cover one, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah that, that, that was fabulous because um, uh, I, I sort of wrote all the songs that I, I'd written on the... I'd, I, I'd sort of written them. We hadn't really played all that much live we we sort of went into the studio and, and did them in the studio but uh, it was fabulous we we'd done western union man and home is where the heart is that that had gone out as a single beforehand and uh, that did really well you know and, and and charted and of course it got rca uh really interested in the in the band and uh, and so we went back and cut that album and uh, it was great because we, we got other horn players in and uh, Bob, Bob and me did the arrangements for them, Bob Bertels, that is. And um, I, I really enjoyed doing that album. It was fabulous. It was, it was a, a, a really new start for us. There'd be a lot of people down here would love to see that re-released on CD. Is there any, any chance of that happening? I don't know. A lot, a lot of people have asked us about that. I think a lot of that stuff's probably been deleted by now. You know, I, I don't even know where half that stuff is because uh, you know it it got sold to, to uh, you know people buy you know when I say people, people record companies they buy y- y- your album and it goes from uh, say RCA to EMI to uh, uh, you know whoever Polydor and uh, you, you, it's really hard to keep track on it and it's very hard to keep track on your royalties as well yeah. I mean uh, but the trouble is you, you know it costs you a fortune to be able to order to all these companies and find out where your money is you know what was the the motivating factor that uh, led you to where you are now based in LA well I was uh, living in London and, and uh, around about 70 Seven, seventy-eight, or something. It's when the punk thing came in, yep. and we're, we're we're still playing gigs around uh, London. And uh, you know, I was playing with people like the Clash, and you know, the Stranglers, and uh, you know, all, all, all those sort of bands. And and the thing was that the kids didn't want to hear us guys. They, you know, we were the ones that were causing the fights. You know, uh, they didn't want to hear us. They wanted to hear the Stranglers, and the, the, you know, the Clash, and people like that. And so. I figured it was time to get out and, 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 and sort of go somewhere where my music might be sort of more welcomed or, you know, uh, or I'd actually, I, 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 what I had actually intended to do was I thought I'm, I'm getting a little long in the tooth. I, maybe I should think of being a you know, back room man, you know, like a writer or producer or something like that. So I thought I'll go to the States and see what I can do. And uh, tell us about the work you're doing over there now. You're involved in um, in sets for for movies, now, isn't it? Yeah, you know, um, we are uh, involved in a company that, 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 that we do uh, rock videos and stuff like that. You know, it's stuff for movies, uh, commercials. You know, we did uh, Just a Gigolo, David Lee Roth, the Material Girl, mm-hmm. for, uh, Madonna. That's a while back, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, and uh, Lenny Kravitz, American Woman. We did that. 
and uh, you know, sort of that's that side of the thing. I've also involved in a little pie company. I've got a pie company over here making dinky die Aussie pies. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> so you've struck a happy balance there between uh, d- still doing your music and, and getting involved in the other work that you're doing over there. Yeah, well, I, I kind of enjoy what I'm doing at the moment. You know, I, I, li- I love coming back to Australia because, you know, I, I'm I'm not there all the time, and so uh, I don't uh, really have a chance to bore everybody silly. You know, like if I'm going around all the time, you, you know, when you when you're in Australia, living in Australia, you have to be working. So, you know, sooner or later, you know, people are going to get really, really sick of you. Yeah. So uh, I, I figured that it's better for me to stay away and come back every now and again, and you know, come back and do maybe nine, ten gigs, go back over here. And then come back a couple of months later and do a few more, and you know, that way it keeps a, a little interest, and uh, you know, you're still fresh all the time. And of course, you took part in the uh, Long Way to the Top Tour a couple of years back. How was that experience for you? Oh, that was fabulous! It was absolutely fabulous. I had such a great time, uh, and it, it was it was great to see all those guys again. Uh, you, you, see, you've got to understand that uh, I hadn't seen most of those guys perform. Because, uh, you know, in the, in, in the days when we were doing things around Melbourne and that, you're arriving at a gig as they're leaving, you mm-hmm. know, and you, you set up a year, do your gig, and then as you're leaving, somebody else is arriving. So you never really got to see, I, I, I never actually got to see Shorrock live, uh, Russell Morris, uh, uh, you, you know, I never seen uh, Marsha, you know, because um, you know, I was overseas at the time when mm-hmm. they, they hit it as well. You That's know? right, yeah. But, uh, uh, it was just fabulous, and it was great to sit on the side of the stage and, and watch everybody every night and see the response. And everybody was rooting for everybody else as well. You know, they, they, we all felt the same. You know, we enjoyed everybody else's act. You know. So tell us about and, the... and, and it was, it was. Sorry, I don't mean to. Interrupt. Nah, you're right. And it, but it, but it was just fabulous to w- look out in the audience when you're on, and you could see all the people mouthing the words of the songs, and <laughs> it was like, it was like you're seeing their their youth go before their eyes, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it was just a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Tell us about the guys in your band now, the, the, the makeup. Well, we got uh, Jimmy Sloggett on saxophone. I've known Jimmy now for close on 41 years. Uh, I met him actually in Auckland when we played a place called the Top, Top 20. We used to play at the Top 20, uh, and uh, they used to have lunch hour sessions as well. So we play one to two in the afternoon, and then at night we're starting around about eight o'clock, I think it was, and play through till midnight. And then on weekends we start at eight o'clock, play through two in the morning. And I'm, I'm talking about one hour sets, and mm. then three three record breaks. I mean, and and they weren't big gaps between the the uh, the songs as we were playing them. You, you, you'd finish one song, dun 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 dun, dun ta, two, three, four, dun 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 dun, dun, dun you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it, it was it, everything was kind of not segue, but everything was uh, you, you kept the pace going all night. So Jimmy used to come in at twelve o'clock at night and uh, and help us out because we were starting to fall apart by twelve o'clock. We're so tired, and he would come in and he'd uh, bring in a bottle of scotch and play saxophone with us. <laughs> and that cheered us up no end. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got John Dallymore on guitar. John's been playing with me ooh, on and off for ooh, close to 15 years. And, you know, everybody knows about John Dallymore. He's a fabulous player. Mm. Uh, he uh, amazes me every night, comes out with something fabulous every night. Uh, David Beanland on keyboards. He's a, another Geelong boy. Uh, he, he he's great. He he, he plays uh, you know all the horn parts with Jimmy and uh, as, as well as all the synth parts as well. Glenn Suckling on bass. He, he's my actual um, MD, if you like. Uh, he, he organizes things and gets the band uh, rehearsing and stuff. And uh, Chris Barton on drums. And Glenn and Chris are both uh, ex giants. Oh yes. Uh, yeah, they and great players, fabulous players. So, so as a band leader, what, what do you look for in a musician that, that makes them suitable to be a meteor? Uh, enthusiasm. Yep. Uh, 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 they've got to have that. Uh, and uh, a love of the music. Uh, and, and, you know, willing to, to, to uh, have some input. You know, like I like the guys to, you know, 
come up with some ideas and uh, and inspire me. You know, uh, it's not just me with a, a bunch of uh, session musicians. I you know, I like to feel like a band. Yeah. You know, it's got to be a band. Now, not too long ago, you put out a, a wonderful DVD recorded down at the Crown. It must have been a fantastic night for you. Oh, it was a great night, yeah. Well, it, 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 virtually you had the same guys there, you know, there was John Dallymore, uh, Jimmy Sloggett, uh, Glenn Suckling, and uh, we had a different drummer that night, but it was, um, it, it, that was a great night, and uh, along with that, we actually put out a, 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 a CD on, with that whole package with uh, four original tunes on it, new ones, ones that I'd written over a period of time, and uh, I was really proud of that. It, it's fabulous, I, I think, you know. And just before we go, Max, uh, what's coming up for you? I believe you're going to be down our way again later in the year? I am. Yeah, I'm going to be down at the end of September. We're doing the Melbourne show. And uh, I, I don't know whether we're going to be doing any smaller venues around, around the town. At, uh, Wally, my, my manager, Wally Bishop, is setting up things at the moment. We've got a, we've got a festival down the coast from Sydney and uh, uh, possibly something up around Newcastle and... But uh, as far as Melbourne at the moment, it's just the Melbourne show. Okay. But um, I, th there's some great uh, places around Melbourne. Well, we we did uh, the uh, Blues Club in Williamstown last time we were out there, and I loved that. Mm. And, of course, I've done the Corner Hotel before, and uh, uh, you know, that, that was a great gig because uh, what we did on that, uh, um, uh, we, we had uh, the trumpet player from... Uh, uh, Wilson Pickett's band. Oh, uh, yeah. Wayne Cobham. He he was the uh, band leader with uh, with Wilson Pickett's band. And he he uh, came out and, and he did uh, the Gimpy, fe uh, you know, muster up there. The Gimpy muster. Yep. And uh, he, we did the Corner Hotel with, with him playing trumpet with us. And it was fabulous. And he had a great time. We had a great time. We still keep in touch. But, uh, and that was, you know, that was a great period too, you know, uh, we did that James Brown thing, we did a, uh, the Ray Charles thing, we did the Wilson Pickett tour, uh, you know, there was a, a period there which was all around about the same time as uh, um, Long Way to the Top, you know, um, it was fabulous, you know, uh, being with those guys, you know, because they were my heroes, they mm. are my heroes, you know, <laughs> I stole so much from them. <laughs> <laughs> Max, thanks so much for your time. It's just an absolute treat to speak to you. Thanks for all that fantastic music. And um, we look forward to the next time you're in town. Hey, John, it's always a pleasure, mate. Thank you. Okay, take care. Thank you, mate. We'll see Bye. you soon. Bye-bye.